Well, I feel better than I sound. I sound terrible right now, I know, but it's uh, um, it's just an old cold that I'm passing around to everybody that I love, so <laughs> got that to look forward to. All right. Um, I want to take one Sunday here and just kind of talk about what's been and what's going on and what's going to happen. And uh, a story uh, came up that I'd been saving. Um, you know, a thousand years ago, a group of Vikings, this isn't, this isn't a TV show, this is real. A group of Vikings set sail from Norway for what was what's come Greenland. And um, they were led, led by Eric the Red. What a name. You know, you guys, you still got a chance to rename your kids. Eric the Red, you know, this, <laughs> just see him. But anyway, they, they made it to Greenland and... Um, it was really what it is now, just kind of an uninhabitable land, but uh, they established these colonies of about 5,000 people, and they, they existed there for 450 years. And we think of Vikings as being these seafarers that got swords, and you know, probably now, if, you know, the, the series, they got piercings too. I don't think the real Vikings had piercings, but anyway, we see them as these real, you know, manly men, but these guys were farmers. They were herdsmen. That's, that's what they liked. They, they, as a matter of fact, to have, have cattle was a status symbol. So after uh, Greenland was deforested by them cutting down, uh, by they cutting down the trees and building their houses and the fertile land, which is really thin, uh, you know, they overgrazed it and then the water and the wind began to erode it. What happened was they, they began to starve after 400 years. Everything just <laughs> kind of fell apart and you know they they ate cattle that was that was their thing that was their status was beef and of course there's abundance of fish around Greenland and that would have been the logical thing thing for them to go to is become fishermen and eat the fish but yet all the archaeological evidence suggests that they never did that um, they would rather starve than to eat fish, and some of you feel that way, but if you really got down to starvation, you would eat fish, trust me. So why would a society that's on the edge of destruction, you know, sitting on top this rich food source, you know, the, the North Atlantic is where they are, and why would they rather die than change? Uh, there's a book written called Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed, uh, by Jared, uh, Jared Diamond, and he argues that when societies fail, it's typically not because of some uh, cataclysmic event, but to something much simpler. And he says that societies fail because people turn inward and they perpetuate their, their moral model at all costs, and they, they try to hold on and to survive, and they fail, in essence, because they refused to change. And that's exactly what happened evidently to the Vikings in Greenland. They had this cultural taboo against eating fish. It simply wasn't done. So when archaeologists began to poke around in their old villages, what they discovered was that, you know, the ruins in this western settlement, they found animal bones left in the debris, and they found the bones of newborn calves which meant that they were eating the newborn calves as soon as they were born. They had forgetting about the future. You know, they weren't going to raise this calf. They also found that they began to eat their pets, you know, and they ate their, the cattle down to the hoofs. They ate everything that was there. But they found no fish bones at all. No fish bones in any of the settlements. They never changed right up to the end. They would rather die than to change. Change is difficult. I mean, it really is. Change, we talk about this all the time. You know, it, uh, people just, you know, TV commercials and everything else are getting close to the first of the year. And you're going to make resolutions. And you're just going to change. It's really, really hard to do to change. You know, it is. And yet, the Son of God came and he said, you know, his first message was, first message of Jesus was repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, change, turn is what he was saying. Now I want you, that to just kind of rattle around for the rest of the day as, as we go on. 
Uh, I want to start with a scripture, Matthew 18, 20. This is the gathering scripture, which is pretty obvious, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. I used to think I knew what that fully meant. I still don't, I don't think I really understand fully what that scripture means. But really what Jesus is talking about is that this is the church. It's any time where there's two or more people that this is church, small c, you know. You become a church like that. And the church isn't an institution. It's not a political movement. Um, it was and it still is where two or more people are. Now when I started thinking about doing a Vision Sunday. It was back in August, and uh, I thought it would be a whole lot easier from August to November than what August to November has been. Because the last few months here uh, have been quite a ride. I mean, really, uh, we've had some challenging times, and some challenging times with finances, no personal challenging problems, thank God. We've not had a fight, right? Right? We, we've not had anybody that we've had to, uh, you know, ask not to speak anymore from the pulpit or anything like that, <laughs> right? Compared to some other problems that some churches have, this is a pretty good problem, really. But, you know, I, I just think about how easy it is. You know, you think you know what the future is going to bring. You don't really know what the future is going to bring. And back in August, I said, we're going to have Vision Sunday in November. And then I thought, I don't know if we can have Vision Sunday in November, And then again, last Sunday, I decided, yeah, we can have Vision Sunday in November, you know, because it was just kind of going up and down. Now, the idea of having a Vision Day isn't something that's unique to the church. Corporations do this, and what they do is the CEO or some communicator comes out, and they get all the employees together, and they get all the... um, they get all the stockholders there that want to come, and he rallies the troops, and he tells them, you guys can do it. Man, we are fantastic we're great, we're a great company, and this is what we've done, and this is where we're going, you know? And um, very motivational, kind of like a locker room kind of talk. And, you know, it uh, says you do the same. The second piece of the story is, is that uh, the motivational speaker always tells you about your competition, about the enemy that you have, that you got to get out there and kill the enemy, you know? And that's, what, that's part of a vision talk, is that I need to tell you how great you are and how we can do it, and then we've got to identify who the enemy is, this other team, so we can beat them, and that's going to motivate you, and we're all getting a huddle and go, yeah, gathering, you know, and I, ah, there we go. Well, this is not that. So I don't want you to be disappointed. Uh, I just want to kind of get that out there. So if you go, well, that isn't what I thought he was going to do. I think he failed at that, you know. What I'm going to do is three things. First, I'm going to start off by interpreting what's going on. And then I'm going to talk about our vision. And then thirdly, I'm going to talk about some strategy. And mainly, I'm going to talk about interpreting because I think this is important right now. Now, we value being authentic here. When something stinks, we admit that it stinks. We, we, we may not talk about it a lot, but nobody hides things here. I, that's very important to us, right? It's, very, it's just like when there's not communion, uh, I didn't go, well, we decided not to have communion today. No, <laughs> we said, no, somebody forgot to make communion. Would somebody go make communion, right? So we, we value, I mean, how can you hide stuff in a church this size? You can't do it. So I just want to own that this has been a difficult year for us. We all know that. We all know it's been a difficult year. Our attendance has been down uh, all year, and and I'm not exactly certain as to why that is. I I know some people have some theories, but uh, fixing the attendance is not really the primary issue. We we celebrated our fifth anniversary, remember, back in March, and most of you were here for that, and some other people were too. And we're, even while we were celebrating that, that fifth anniversary, we knew that Something was kind of missing. We came out from that and we went, huh, well, that was good, wasn't it? Remember that? I said, yeah, that was, that was great. Wasn't it good? Yeah, that was, that was pretty good. But we knew back then that we were headed into a season and, and, and yet, you know, didn't know what to do about it. Um, since we're a, a small church, we have some families that are out of town and we have something else, and we all feel that. And I, I know that sounds kind of selfish, but we're always going, I wonder where they are. 
you know, and then we run on to Facebook and try and investigate to see if they were out, you know, playing today or something like that, you know. Some of some people do. I would never do anything like that, of course, you know. And all this sounds kind of childish, but we also do it, even if we don't know it, because this is the truth about the church. And remember, I've been saying that there are four primary uh, metaphors and models of the church, and and that's family and body and temple and building, right? And, you know, family is one that we probably understand and, and hits pretty close. And, and I was thinking about that, that, you know, when somebody's missing here and we go, well, I wonder where they are. And it's just like your family. You know, when somebody's missing in the family, you go, wonder, I wonder if she's mad. I wonder if he's mad. I wonder what's going on. When I was a freshman in high school, I was uh, at a military academy, another story, but we're just at a military academy, let's leave it at that. And I came to Thanksgiving and my um, roommate asked me to go home with him. He was a Jewish boy uh, from Michigan City, Indiana. Now, I'm Don, son of Chester and Wilma, from Morrisonville, Illinois, farmland, and I have a Jewish roommate, and I didn't even know what a Jew was. Never met a Jew in my life. But he asked me to go home with him, so I asked Mom, and she didn't like it very much. But she reluctantly, probably after me whining and, you know, stuff for a while, she let me go under one condition. That was that we would talk on Thursday morning on Thanksgiving. And we went, went home with this guy and had a great time with his extended Jewish family. I mean... Most Jewish families really know how to do family. You know, you don't miss family or they'll come get you and drag you to the table on Shabbat. But uh, we, we were there on Thursday and a and, um, phone call came and talked to mom. And, and while I was talking to her, she started crying. Well, my mom doesn't cry. She only cries rarely, you know back then so she gave the phone to dad and dad didn't know what to say to me and you know you made it okay well yeah I made it okay you know that kind of stuff but it uh you know why are they crying I'm fine I'm 14 years old I'm up here with this family what are they crying about and what they're crying about is because it's Thanksgiving and there's an empty seat at the table you ever been at a family meal when somebody's not there Maybe they're away at college or maybe something's happened. They chose to go someplace else for vacation. You look around the table and somebody's missing. It's like, this just isn't right. And I, I kind of think that's what this is in this, this church that we have, the gathering. Somebody's missing. We go, I wonder what's going on. I, you know, I wonder why they're not here. And it's an empty chair. And so I guess what I'm saying is, is that those weeks when there are some empty chairs and we feel down, it's because we have a higher opinion of what church is. Okay? When someone is missing, it's not the same thing. And, of course, somebody's missing every week, and so we're always going, I wonder if she's all right. I wonder if he's okay. Now, I value that. Do you value that? I value that a lot. I think one of the worst things for me would be to get lost in a church, you know, and that's just, you know, who I am. But I think that's important. So, so this year we've had some low days, and recently there's been some weeks. Um, you know, we're going to talk about this a little bit later. This isn't a money pitch. There'll never be a money pitch. But we've had some bills. We've had to wait another week to pay that by, and we realized that we weren't just a bunch of rich white folks in church that had a lot of money, that we were like everybody else in the world, that we have financial problems sometimes. And that wasn't all bad for us. But um, this is where I kind of want to start and give an interpretation as something that may be new to you. I want to put up this matrix that we call the imitation challenge matrix. And this is a, an analysis tool that you can use for an organization. Or you can use it personally for yourself. And... Uh, the matrix is really taken from Jesus because Jesus was always about um, the invitation and the challenge at the same time. And probably the, the best known example of this was Jesus and the rich young ruler. And remember the, the rich man came to him, the young ruler came to him, he says, what must I do to, to get eternal life? 
Well, and, and Jesus says, you, you know, you ask him some questions. And then Jesus says, well, you're doing a really good job. You got all this stuff down. You only lack one thing. There's only one problem. And that is, you know, you need to sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. So now you stop and think about that. There's that combination right there of invitation and challenge. Jesus is very inviting. I want you to follow me, right? But there's also a challenge. You just lack one thing. You've got to go sell this. You know, there's, you've got this one God that you've been worshiping. You've got to give this God up before you can follow me. And that's an example of how Jesus was always inviting and challenging, always accepting a people, but always calling them up higher. Uh, another one I think of um, uh, the young lady that was caught in adultery. And he says, I don't condemn you. It's very inviting, very accepting. But then the end of it, he says, go and go. Don't sin anymore. Wow. You know, and we, every instance that we see with Jesus where he's interacting with people, it's invitation. I, I want you. I, I, I'm, I'm encouraging you. And the same thing, uh, but there's a higher level that I'm going to call you to. Here's a challenge for your life. Now, the two lines in the matrix, the vertical one is, is the invitation, a high invitation at the top, low invitation at the bottom. And, of course, the horizontal one there is a challenge, high invitation, over here on the right, low invitation on the left, and that breaks us into four quadrants. I don't know if you like stuff like this. It's not really my big thing, but this helps me. Um, now, we can use this to get some insight into our personal lives and also into this congregation. At, at the first time that, that I did this for the gathering, it was evident that we were all in the midst of very high invitation and very low challenge and we were over here in that quadrant where it says cozy culture and what that produces as consumers. And we joke a lot about that here, you know. You don't have to do anything at the gathering. It's, it's fine. It's a gathering. You know, want to wear your pajamas. That's fine. It's a gathering. You know, we, how cozy it is. And, and we're trying to move away from that some. But personal life can be just the same way. We can be in a, a period in life where we just, we just want to settle we don't want any challenge. We want everything to feel good. We want everything to be comfortable. And, you know, we avoid people who challenge us. We, we may be in a season where we think that we just can't handle anything more. So, so we surround ourselves with high invitation people, people who are very encouraging and accepting of us, but never would call us out or challenge us or bring us up any. We just, we just go day to day to day in cozy and cozy feels good. It really does. Except we know that there's something more in cozy. So we say, God, please, please solve my problems. Please bless me, bless me, bless me. No, don't challenge me because I like comfortable. I don't want high challenge because I might get stressed. So in that high invitation, low challenge life, we kind of just get by. We just maintain and we become like the Vikings. We just eat the cattle till they're all gone. We wouldn't dare change a thing. We're consumers. I mean, how can you help me? We look at the churches. What can you give me? What can you do for me? I mean, do I like it? Does this make me feel good? But, but in that cozy place, you see, there's no breakthroughs. We never change there. There's no breakthroughs in life. We never grow. And eventually, the resources all become depleted there if we live there. In an organization or personally, and, and life gets bad. So how do we get into that upper right quadrant, that discipling culture? That's really what we call the breakthrough uh, quadrant up there where it's high challenge and it's also high invitation, uh, that place where there's kingdom living. And the first time I saw this, I really didn't much think, think much of this, but you can't just go across. You just don't go, okay, I'm cozy. Now I'm over here and breakthrough. But you have to kind of go, you lose that invitation as we become challenged and you dip down into that stress culture. And I think this is where we are. <laughs> I think this is where we've been. Uh, as, as a church, as we've been in this, this stress place, because we have purposely, I have purposely increased the challenge here, okay? Hopefully not just from the messages, but also individually to you and when that happens we start to cause some stress 
And as a church, I think we are experiencing that. We go down before we come back up. And that's my interpretation is exactly what's going on here. I think that we are in the midst of, of entering into a high challenge, high invitation quadrant, uh, if that makes any sense to you. Now, the invitation is for everybody. Uh, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, I don't use the message uh, translation very much. Um, I, I prefer some others, but um, this is from Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. It just shows this high invitation to everybody. And this, this passage... Uh, and other translations would be, Come to me all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, because my, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Learn from me, is what Jesus says. But uh, Peterson here says, Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I, I like a couple of phrases in there. You know, he says, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. That's discipleship. How did Jesus do life? How did Jesus interact with people? That's discipleship. But the, challenge, the, the invitation is for everybody. But the challenge is, there, is great there too. Not just from this scripture, but in other places. You know, Jesus says, the, hey, the, he said, the road is so broad that leads to destruction. And it's, it's very, very narrow that leads to life. We go, wait, Jesus, why didn't you make that the other way around? Well, because this is what he's telling us. The, the bar is high to follow him. To represent him in this world is not an easy thing to do. You're going to mess it up a lot. We're going to feel a lot like I didn't do a good job. And at the same time, we feel like I didn't do a good job at this. We're never going to feel rejected by Jesus. You see? But, but the challenge is, is big. And are you ready for the challenge? I, I mean, I want to call us to a higher life in Christ. And I, I, I'm calling us to life that's more than just attendance. It's, it's a life where we accept the challenge from Jesus to be who he's called us to be. That's not an easy thing to do. That's my interpretation of what's been happening. And I, I firmly believe that if we will accept that challenge, all of us accept that challenge, not just a few of us, that God will create a culture where we naturally live like Jesus. We have to get out of cozy. Now, the second part here is vision. And to do this next part, I, I want to kind of tell you a story. When um, it was 30 years ago last week, uh, Nina and I and our three children left uh, Illinois. And this guy from Cicero pulls in this big truck and packs all of our stuff up. That's Chicago. And he packs all of our stuff up and puts in this giant truck and out he goes and we're going into ministry and it's you know just pretty wild time and we were saying goodbye to family and friends that we had known all of our lives and saying goodbye to the financial resources of the place where we were and just you know we're just crazy faithful that's all I can say just you know I'm not sure we understood that what we were doing I'm not sure we'd do it if we understood what we were doing right but we just left as we were leaving, the pastor of this church that we were in, and, and it's a, just a dynamic little church, and you've heard me talk about Jim. Jim very seldom was prophetic. If you know what I mean by that. I mean, he didn't tell people what to do, but prophetic means that you kind of have an insight from the Holy Spirit sometimes into somebody's lives. And Jim just wasn't that guy. He wasn't a prophetic guy, but he gave us this piece of paper and on, and he says, I think this is for you from God. And so this is what, this is the word that was said to us here. See if you would think much of this. He says, you are to go into desert places, empty, barren, unpleasant, unhealthy. About this time, we want to tear it up, right? <laughs> right? And there for me, plant an oasis. I will provide the water even out of barren, flinty rocks, 
my living waters will flow. You go, dig, and plan. I will bring the increase. That's what he sent us off with. To be quite honest with you, I didn't really think much of it. Unhealthy, unpleasant places, you know. I thought I was going to be a star. I, I really thought. <laughs> And he gives that to us. So Nida stuck it away and um, spent 30 years. Last February, when I was at the 3DM Immersion Conference, and uh, young Brent Barger, who some of you guys know, he's been here, and he stood up for the morning invitation, or meditation, excuse me, early in the morning at worship, and he said these words. He said, you may have received a word from God. He said, that you didn't want. That's what he said. Now, how did he know? He said, 30 years, you know, you may have received a word from God in the past that God is reminding you about that you really didn't want. And I went, oh, gee, Lord. <laughs> you know, and it all came back to me. And so I was, I was repentant, and I admitted that I've never liked this. I've never liked this word. I mean, it was, but I look at it, and this is our lives. Do you see the invitation, the challenge here? He says, it's, it's going to be a barren, unpleasant, unhealthy. Oh, you talk about challenging, but invitation. You go, I want you, you plant, you dig, you plan, okay? And I really think this is, looking back over the last 30 years, this was from God. I wish that I would have accepted this 30 years ago. And, um, you know, it's, it's just right where we are. I, I, I accept that God has not called me to pastor a city, but pastor an oasis. There's a difference between planting a city and an oasis. In, in the city, you see, you get to stay put. And there's safety, and there's importance, and other people come and they join you. But an oasis, you plant an oasis, and you dig and you plant this place for people that are going across the desert. And boy, I mean, we've had a lot of people come through here that have been walking across the desert. And they're looking for something. They need some health. They need some nourishment. I really wanted to be a city planner. All right? I wanted to plant a big church. Right? And I know that I wasn't really going to do that, but that was in my heart. And God says, no, you just plant an oasis. Just plant a place where people can come, and maybe they become other oasis planters. I don't know, but that metaphor works for me. It's a place when, when you're worn out, you can come here and you can rest, and you can get restored, and you can get nourishment. Now, that's the vision. I, I state the obvious for us again that we are not called to be a place to hide from the world, a place just to fill our needs. But we are always about the ones who are hungry and tired. We are not building a church for ourselves. We are building a church for other people. And the vision is, it says, of, of a place where people can get in. Anybody can stop at an oasis. Not everybody gets led into the city. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that's the vision. Now, just let me close with a little bit of strategy. One thing I've heard from so many people over the last six months is that, Don, we talk about community a lot, but we don't have much. Mm. Yeah. I forgive you for saying that, all of you. <laughs> the reality is, we need to own this, is that we become a Sunday morning church. That's what we become. That can't continue. It can't continue that we be, just stay a Sunday morning church. I mean, what we're saying is the oasis is open from 9.30 to 12 one day a week. If you happen to be hurting on Sunday morning from 9.30 to 12, we got a place for you. But the rest of the time, eh, you know. Discipleship is about relationships, and relationships, they take time to develop, and it's not easy. It's not just our relationships with each other, but it's relationships with other people who are tired and who are hurting and are, are walking through the desert. 
And so in the future, and, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to have more church community functions, obviously, and that's easy to do, okay? We stopped some of these things just so we could go down in through that, that lower quadrant, all right? We needed to be less invitational and more challenging. And, and I hope that, and I, I really believe that we're going to start a couple missional communities this year. Uh, I, I think God has poised us to do that. But this is slow work. This is not fast work. So I want you to be patient with it. You know, this is uh, revolution by evolution. It's slow. You can't just put a program in and make this happy. It take, happen. It takes time to make relationships. So here's my challenge to us today. Here's one, one challenge. You've heard a lot of challenging things already. But I want you to make a new friend this year. Not a Facebook friend. I want you to make a real friend. I want you to make a we eat together friend. You know what I mean? Now, as you get older, guys, you're going to find out that this gets harder and harder. It really does. It gets harder and harder. So become good at it young. So you don't have to try to learn it when you're old. But make a new friend this year. Make somebody. It doesn't have to be a Christian friend by all means. You know, sow some seed in somebody else's field here, right? But, but make yourself a new friend this year. I know this is, sounds so simple, and yet how many of us have made one new friend every year? I mean, the kind of we eat lunch together friend, okay? I move his junk when he moves, that kind of friend. Oh, boy, yeah, I know. That, that really raised the bar there for a lot of guys. He's going to call me to move. Yep, that kind of a friend. Make a new friend this year. So if you'll receive that, do it. Now, I want to give us a word for 2015. The word that I'm going to give you is together. All right? Look at the times that that's used in Scripture. Some neat places. Sometimes that Matthew Scripture that we started off where it says we're two or three, some of the translations say, instead of saying have gathered, they say are together. But on the day of Pentecost, the disciples were all together, okay? There's many places that they did everything in Acts 2 together. So that's our word for 2015. And I want to give us a scripture for 2015, and that's Ephesians 1, 18 to 19. This is a prayer that Paul had for the church at Ephesus. And I, love, I just love this prayer, so I wanted us to have this for next year. And he says, I ask that your minds may be opened to see his light. This is the Good News Bible, but I like this one here. As you see, I use anything. Um, so, so that you will know what is the hope to which he has called you, how rich are the wonderful blessings he promises his people, and how very great is his power at work in us who believe. The hope of his calling to you. What, what if you got the light? I mean, that means you get revelation. What if you got the revelation so that you understood what God hoped for your life, his calling upon your life? You know, very few people actually get the calling of God on their life. We settle. What if you, what if you found out what your calling was from God to do for him in his kingdom? That's what this prayer is asking for, that you would understand the calling of his life upon you. You see, I had a calling in my life and I took part of it and said, I don't like that part. And it took me 30 years to find it again. <laughs> well, what if you got it today in your, uh, when, when you're nine or you're 20 or you're 60, you know, but you, you got the calling of God in your life. And then he says that you'll have wonderful blessings. As we accept that call, then life becomes a blessing. Even when bad things happen, it's still a blessing. And then he says that there's going to be power, his power. It's not our power. We don't strive to do this. It's his power, just like in that, in that, that prophecy that I, that I shared with you, that he would give the increase, okay? He's the one that's going to do that. So I'm going to put that, that scripture in our bulletin most Sundays, but I want you to, I want you to chew on it or, or meditate on it. I want you to think about that. This is what... Paul is praying over us as a church. Uh, Paul's prayer, it's a, anytime you have a prayer in Scripture, it's powerful. All right? Now, closing thing. The, the old questions. What is God saying to you? And what are you going to do about it? 
What is he saying to you right now about what I've just um, given you? Saying to you about the interpretation part about the stress, maybe how it impacts your life. Saying to you about the vision part. Are you with that vision? I mean, I, I release you if you're not with that vision. I don't want anybody to say, well, that's Don's thing. i got to do it for him. If you're not okay with creating an oasis for other people, then you need to find some place where you, that vision, you've got another vision. I, I release you. I really do. So what's God saying to you? And it seems to me that if God is saying to you, that's what I want to do with your life, okay, then here's the challenge. Here's the challenge for us is that our priority of what we do has got to come up a notch. This can't be just something else in a long list of priorities down the line. But this has got to move way up the list if it's going to work for you. If you're going to find your calling, if you're going to get the blessing, if you're going to see God's power, it's got to come up the list of priorities. I want you to think about that today. Let's, let's close the prayer. As deep cries out